Well, let's go back to our, let's go to our conversation now. It's the five billion naira palliatives for each state. And to further understand the idea of the National Economic Council, I'm joined by the special advisor on media and spokesperson to the president, Mr. Ajuri Ngilali. Welcome to Politics Today, Ajuri. It's always a privilege to be here. Now, just before we go into the conversation of the five billion naira palliatives mm -hmm. for each state, I think it's fair to quickly address the... Uh, statements which you released on the transition to compressed natural gas uh, enabled vehicles. Could you talk quick briefly as much as you as briefly as you can about that? Absolutely. So uh, as you know, uh, His Excellency President Bola Ahmed Tinubu is taking a robust approach uh, to ameliorating the difficult conditions in which our people currently find themselves. Uh, obviously, we know that with rising energy costs, there is an immediate need uh, to do everything we can as quickly as we can uh, to uh, crash uh, energy costs in the country, which is why today Mr. President approved the establishment of the Presidential Compressed Natural Gas Initiative to be chaired by His Excellency, the Chief of Staff to the President, Right Honorable Femi Baja Biamila. And how it's going to work in effect is that we are going to uh, provide upfront uh, 55,000 CNG conversion kits, which will be targeting specifically uh, at, at the outset uh, intra-city uh, uh, mass transit systems across all states of the Federation. We recognize that uh, the disproportionate bulk of our people being affected uh, most, uh, you know, most adversely uh, by rising energy costs, rising PMS uh, costs in particular, uh, are those uh, using mass transit, those uh, using Kekena Peps, those using Okada. They're feeling it uh, with very low incomes to, to, to deal with that. So that is why we're targeting mass transit systems. Uh, we are providing uh, these kits to essentially convert PMS-dependent buses, uh, bu uh, you know, mass transit vehicles uh, into uh, CNG-compliant vehicles in, at, at the outset. In addition to that, uh, we are, uh, His Excellency Mr. President has now approved uh, or is approving the uh, zero customs duty and zero VAT on the importation of all CNG conversion kits to immediately ensure the uh, very swift inflow of as many CNG conversion kits into the country, even as we move to locally assemble and locally manufacture the CNG kits, uh, conversion kits over the short to medium term. Uh, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, His Excellency Mr. President is also uh, approving a one-stop shop uh, across all states of the Federation in which uh, CNG uh, uh, related industries. These are those who want to establish CNG filling stations, those who want to establish CNG conversion fitting factories, those who want to establish CNG conversion kit production factories, uh, that we put together this one-stop shop uh, in all states of the Federation where you can essentially uh, uh, gather all of your uh, federal and state regulatory compliances and, and certifications uh, so that you're not having to go through a, a long gestation period of process and running from one bureaucracy to the other in order to establish these facilities. So we're taking a multi-dimensional approach to this, a thorough one, because we, uh, because of Mr. President's experience as a subnational administrator, a former governor of Lagos State for eight years, he knows where the shoe pinches the foot, and he knows that many of the interventions that any federal administration wants to make, uh, is, it's going to e it's going to either work or fail, depending on how it's applied and implemented at the subnational level. Which is why we are focused in on working through bodies such as the National Economic Council, where you have all 36 state governors, where you have, uh, you know, His Excellency the Vice President chairing to ensure that it's driven at the state level, but in such a way uh, that is guided by private sector participation and guided by the regulation of federal authorities. So it's not uh, as simple as uh, maybe organized labor is making it out to seem that this is some sort of, uh, you know, cash giveaway or some sort of bonanza that's unchecked and unmonitored where state governments can effectively do whatever they want. So, so we, ha we hadn't come to the conversation of the five billion naira politics right, and right, right, labor. Right. But let me ask you this. With regards to the CNG that mm -hmm. you talked about, mm -hmm. um, what's the implementation strategy with regards to funding and uh, what sort of stakeholders will be directly involved in it? That, that's a fantastic question, Terry. So uh, let's start with the fact that we've already struck an agreement uh, between uh, the NNPC Limited and NIPCO, which is an indigenous uh, industry player in the oil and gas sector, uh, which effectively is going to see to the establishment of 56 new CNG filling stations across all states of the Federation uh, in two phases. The first phase is going to run from approximately uh, now 
to uh, the end of April 2024, approximately a nine-month period, uh, which will see to the establishment of 21 out of the 56. And then the second phase, which runs from April 2024 to April 2025, one year, uh, which will see to the establishment of the next 35 CNG filling stations across all states of the Federation. It's important to note that the NIPCO agreement is just one out of several that we're currently in negotiations with. Uh, you already have uh, you know, certain uh, retail uh, outlets upstream uh, companies in the sector, uh, such as the NMPC Limited, for example, that has the widest network of retail filling stations in the country, which we can now leverage on to co-locate within those facilities CNG fill-up points, in addition to the existing PMS fill-up points that you find at NMPC filling stations. There is going to be several uh, new outlets that will deal with the demand side of it, right? Making sure you can access the CNG once you've converted your vehicle. But our focus with the Presidential Compressed Natural Gas Initiative under Mr. President and under the leadership of His, uh, His Excellency the Chief of Staff is to ensure that we deal with the demand side, that we have a, a network across all states of the Federation of, of mass transit systems that are uh, operating uh, almost exclusively over a period of time, uh, CNG field uh, buses. In places like India, for example, there are currently law, it's currently uh, law in India that mandates <laughs> Uh, you know, mass transit systems to be fueled by CNG. It's actually a mandate. We obviously don't start there, but we can get to the point where uh, we can incentivize mass transit companies with various uh, asset financing packages it, from the federal government to be able to ensure that they're able to roll out these buses at scale and it, quickly. Two things now, quickly, as, as, as quickly as right, possible. Right. Is it clear as to how much uh, the federal government would be contributing financially despite uh, beyond the partnership that you've talked about and is there a takeoff date for this yet? Well the president had already cited in his most recent address that 100 billion naira had been set aside for the uh, procurement of 3,000 buses but obviously with the presidential uh, compressed natural gas initiative uh, we're talking about 11,500 buses which is significantly more across the states but uh, it's worth noting that this is not a, a federal giveaway or a state giveaway this is uh, well uh, meticulously arranged, uh, you know, private sector partnership with the federal government. So we're looking at making sure that we can put together uh, a minimum of 250 billion at the outset uh, to be able to uh, provide a counterpart funding mechanism uh, for the private sector to come in with certain financing guarantees and also tax relief, uh, uh, you know, incentives uh, for not just those who are establishing, you know, CNG fill-up points, but those who are establishing CNG conversion kit uh, fa uh, fitting. Uh, factories as well as CNG conversion kit manufacturing factories in addition to several other industries such as CNG fuel bus manufacturing facilities. Well, very well then let's talk about the five billion naira palliatives right. to each state now. Mm -hmm. uh, you already know that the, uh, the labor unions are against uh, the implementation through the state governors mm -hmm. and it's not far-fetched. You can recall what happened to the COVID-19 palliatives and concerns regarding bailout funds. So yeah. what is the implementation strategy or perhaps the rationale behind using state governors to distribute those, these palliatives? Well, it, it, it really comes back to the fact that, and look, earlier in the week, uh, you might recall that there was a threat from the organized labor movement. It's relevant to what I'm about to say in a moment, but there was a threat that there was going to be a nationwide strike without any warning uh, if fuel price went up, for example. And then, of course, uh, on behalf of Mr. President, I came out and announced that there would be no increase uh, in, uh, in the fuel price uh, as it was threatened by organized labor. The reason why I'm mentioning that is we have seen this tendency that, yes, there is suffering in the land. Yes, times are absolutely difficult, which is why every waking moment that the president spends from morning to night, all he's thinking about is how he's going to, uh, as swiftly and as efficiently as possible, put together as many uh, implementable measures as possible uh, to, to ameliorate the adverse conditions facing our people from rising energy costs to rising food costs, etc. This is the focus of our government. But uh, we think it is not helpful to the body politic if we have this perpetual sense of panic and antagonism, that's totally unnecessary. Uh, when we can be civil with each other uh, and we can be, uh, we can be factual and honest uh, in, in terms of our engagements with each other. Uh, organized labor uh, must adopt a culture of d doing its due diligence and fact-checking and fact-finding. 
before it comes to the public with these belligerent and verbose statements against uh, certain parties. Uh, you, now, you, you, I, I'm, I'm coming no, to no, something. You recall that right. I, I drew your attention to the concerns of Labour with regard to the COVID-19 No, and that's where I'm going. That's that. where I'm so going. when you talk that's, about yes. fact-finding, what's yes. on ground, which Labour is holding on to, is the behavior or attitude of the governors when right. they were uh, right. saddled with the responsibility of distributing COVID-19 palliatives and some state governors till this moment cannot account and for that's bailout just, funds. Thank you very much, Terry. That's exactly where I was going. I wanted to lay the groundwork to show that there's this trend that we, we it's a cultural issue that we need to address. Uh, this notion that everything has to be a fight. Everything does not have to be a fight. We can respect people and people can respect people and groups and organizations can respect each other and still get to conclusions that will positively impact the lives of our people. What I'm saying in effect uh, with respect to what you mentioned now is that yes, it is true that there has been mismanagement of uh, you know, federal interventions uh, you know, with respect to uh, you know, social investments and some of the, these things in the past. Certainly, uh, government is a, a large operation and you're going to have bad eggs that, uh, that commit blunders uh, within that. But this is exactly why His Excellency Mr. President said we, we have to move beyond this, this notion that uh, the federal government uh, and specifically Mr. President himself, can stay in an office and from that office essentially uh, you know, ensure that from beginning to the end of a process it's going to be administered from the federal side. If you try and do that, as we've seen in the past, you're going to have actors ac uh, along that chain uh, of command that are going to do the wrong thing. So what the president is saying is let's take more of a bottom-up approach. Let's appreciate the fact that local governments and state governments and the, and the moves that they make directly impact the people. So what we're doing now is this. Yes, the state governments are being empowered uh, to, to the extent that uh, they are implementing some of the, the palliatives that we're talking about with re respect to uh, the delivery of rice and maize to communities across their states uh, and other uh, supplements that are well known by now. But what we are also doing is from the federal end, uh, we're ensuring that these funds are not just giveaway grants that don't have to be paid back. First of all, it's a loan facility. So if you're a state government and you know your people are hurting, and by the way, these state governors that the organized labor movement is you know, painting all 36 of them with the same brush, as if all of them are the same, all of them that perform at the same level, all of them have the same competency, we know that's a ridiculous assertion. What we're saying is Nigerians elected these state governors just as they elected the president, and we have to trust the, uh, the, the judgment of Nigerians who elected these officers to conduct these activities on their behalf. So it can't just be, uh, you know, at the outset panicking that they can't do it. We have to trust them to do the jobs they were elected to do. But at the same time, it is fair to say that given the history of maladministration in our country, especially with these kinds of uh, palliatives and distribution mechanisms from the federal side, it is fair to say that there needs to be a check, there needs to be a means of monitoring, which is why uh, federal regulators are involved, which is why we have put in place uh, you know, the, the palliative distribution. For example, if we're talking about MSME capitalization, aside from the food now, I've touched on energy, touched on food. MSME capitalization is going to be about $300 billion, $300 billion, uh, sorry, 300 billion naira uh, combined. That process is going to be distributed through microfinance banks, through the Bank of Industry, and through Smedan, who already have, for example, set registers of beneficiaries uh, that they can make digital, ca uh, digital payments to. So, for example, if we want to make a digital payment from, uh, say, through Smedan or through BOI, to uh, the various industries that are going to benefit, to the various uh, micro businesses that are going to benefit. These are direct digital payments. It has nothing to do with the local government. It has nothing to do with the state government. These are direct payments that can be tracked uh, through mm -hmm. the BVN. Let, let, let's, let's stay with the issue of the yes. uh, five billion dollar politics. Mm -hmm. for I'm talking about enhancing trust. That's why I mentioned that. But, well, beyond enhancing trust, the concern with regard to how the mode of distribution of these politics mm -hmm. is not clear yet, especially because the social register has been condemned by the neck already. So, no, what, no, other da what data? One register. I, I what correct. data would mm -hmm. you use to distribute these items? Okay, so uh, f a few things here. Uh, number one, uh, we have with the state governments; they already have uh, structures in place. You know, the state governments have already conducted their own, uh, you know, social investment program separate from the federal end. I think there is this kind of misunderstanding in the public domain at the moment that that the social investment policy, because it was something that 
uh, pre uh, former President Mohamedou Buhari really brought to the national consciousness on a mass scale mm -hmm. that it's kind of a federal thing to do. But that's not the case. For the last several years, you have had state governments with their own articulated social intervention programs. If you go to Borno State, for example, where uh, Professor Babagana Umara Zulum has essentially uh, created a very uh, well-articulated uh, social investment program across not just local governments, I mean down to the wards across the uh, Borno state. This, th because it was well-built, for I'm just giving you an example, because it was well-built, he's attracting funding from the World Bank, he's attracting funding from the United Nations, because they, had, they were part and parcel of the process of building uh, these uh, social investment distribution systems within the states at the subnational level. My point is that you have similar, similar systems built in places like Quara, in places like uh, Iboni, in several states across the Federation. So this is exactly what I mean when I say that we should avoid the tendency toward oversimplification when we say, oh, state governors can't be trusted, they're all corrupt, they're all incompetent. Organized labor should protect its credibility. And if it wants to do so, it should avoid making blanket statements that even Nigerians know at this point cannot be true. Ajiri, where's the 185 billion naira coming from? Fantastic. So we have a, 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 essentially a packet of 500 billion naira that's going to be sourced from uh, various portfolios within the Central Bank of Nigeria. So for example, uh, on the CNG... Is that uh, the 500 billion approved by Parliament? I'm, I'm, I'm coming, please. Just give me one moment. They, first of all, many of the uh, portfolios that, had been, that we're going to be dispersing from had already been approved from a previous parliament, for, to answer your question. So you have the uh, expand, uh, gas expansion program with, that has a portfolio of approximately $250 billion within the central bank, which we're going to be able to draw down on, already approved, uh, that we're going to be able to draw down on to be able to facilitate uh, the presidential uh, compressed natural gas initiative in co collaboration with the private sector, for example. Then we also have uh, a, another separate packet for large industries. You recall uh, we talked about the 75 for 75. That's 75 billion naira that's going to be given uh, at 1 billion naira per large industry across all states of the federation. That is going to be administered uh, by the Bank of Industry uh, through a register that they had independently within their institution, uh, you know, developed over a period of time in collaboration with foreign uh, with international partners then on in terms of nano because that deals with large industry in terms of nano industry which is very important to us as an administration because we believe that progressivism is all about bottom-up economic uh, progress okay. and development so the idea is that uh, with our uh, nano economic intervention MSME capitalization intervention what we're going to do is we, we're selecting through SMEDAN, that's the Small and Medium Scale Enterprises Development uh, uh, Agency of Nigeria. Uh, we're going to essentially provide uh, uh, 1,300 micro-businesses in each of every single local government of this country. Like, 1,300 and 774 we're, we're, we're uh, with MSME uh, 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 capital. We're out of time, but I think this includes the FCT, right? Absolutely, so absolutely. The that, the that, con yeah, that controversy should die. The FCT is going to be involved through the FCTA under right. the minister of FCT that is incoming. Very well, that I'd like to thank you for your time on uh, politics today. T thank you very much. Time's never enough. Never enough, I must say.